It was a crazy trip. A two-day trip with only stops for gas, restroom, and fast food home after what was supposed to be two weeks of renewal. It was getting late. We got home and there was barely any edible food in the house. Got up early for work, stopped by the local donut shop to eat a couple of my favorites and grab a coffee on the way. The whole office was surprised by my very early return. There was no time for a full lunch, so I ate a package of cheese crackers and a soda at my desk. Met with the boss and got my ass kicked for someone else's mistake. I get home just in time to see my wife, Lori, driving down the street in a rented truck. Her destination is unknown, at least to me. I pulled a protein bar out of the refrigerator we had brought with us on the ill-fated trip. The food we had put in it when we left was lying there unused. The ice and ice packs had melted and everything was warm. The protein bar was soaked in water from the melted ice and was inedible. In the living room, almost all the things she had before the wedding were gone. I went to the bedroom. The dresser and her childhood dresser were gone too. None of her things were there and the closet was empty. In the kitchen, on the island, stood three dirty coffee cups. Her family's china and crystal were gone. None of this came as a surprise. The purpose of the trip was to try to resolve a few issues in our two-year marriage. Honestly, we only had one big one, but it was the most serious. To cheat or not to cheat, that was the question. My vote was in favor of not cheating. One of the songs the DJ played at our reception was about a feverish wedding, and it described us very well. We had only known each other for six months before the wedding. Can you imagine how many people told both of us that getting married so early was a huge mistake? Short answer. Pretty much everyone I knew or was involved with. The same was true for her, but we didn't listen because we were in love and knew everything better than all of them combined. God, what idiots we were. The fever mentioned in the reception song ended pretty soon after the priest pronounced us husband and wife. The remnants of the wedding cake had not yet had time to get stale before the trouble began. It all started with her new boss's son, a college soccer player who was raised to believe he was entitled to whatever he wanted. His father bought the car dealership where my wife worked. There are six car dealerships in our town, and after Martin Justin Jr. bought the one Lori worked at, he owned three of them. Lori worked there for four years and was instrumental in getting my cousin Jeffrey hired at the car dealership. Everyone who knew Jeff loved him and trusted him. He's not the smartest or fastest guy in the world, and cleaning cars was a job he enjoyed and did well. He's also a pretty decent mechanic, but he never had the confidence to do it on a regular basis. He was one of my best men at my wedding, and in addition to being my cousin, I considered him a good friend. After Justin bought the dealership, his son didn't come in at first because he was in school, but when the summer was over, he started dropping by and the office, where mostly women worked, became his favorite hangout spot. It wasn't long before Lori's desk became the center of his universe when he was at the dealership. At first, according to Lori, he was annoying. Then she didn't say anything about him, and I figured he'd either stopped or moved on to someone else to annoy. Jeff was more silent than usual one evening as he and I sat on the porch of Lori and I's rented house. He loved beer but had a very low tolerance for alcohol, so I always had a beer nearby for him. If he knew the difference, he never said anything. Don't misunderstand. He's not dumb. He just can't grasp things very quickly, but when he learns something, anything, he never forgets it. And he's very loyal to his friends, especially me. So we sat on the porch. He said nothing and hardly touched his drink. I often noticed that he looked at me. Okay, Jeff. What's wrong? Roger likes Lori. Roger was Justin's son. I chuckled. Everyone likes Lori. Lori likes Roger. No, he doesn't. Tim, I'm not that slow. He spends a lot of time talking to her. Today he left for lunch at the same time she did, and they got back at the same time. Lori never went out to lunch. She always ate in the break room and watched game shows on TV. Are you sure? He nodded slowly. It was the first sign that there was trouble in paradise. We didn't talk about it again that night. When she got home, I asked her if everything was okay at work and if she had any problems. It's all right. Why do you ask? No reason. Roger was a pest before, and you haven't thought of him in a long time. Oh, he's still a pest, but I can handle him. The second, third, and fourth signs came quickly, and they all came from Jeff. Inappropriate touches, 
like his hand on her ass or her hand on his leg when they sat close together. Things like that, but nothing that directly indicated infidelity. I didn't like what I was hearing, but I didn't say anything about it to Lori. I just asked Jeff to keep an eye on them and let me know what he saw. On those occasions when he saw something inappropriate, he would call me. I was usually pretty aggressive and confrontational, but here I was taking it slow for a couple reasons. First, I didn't want to think about her doing something inappropriate, like cheating, but I also didn't want to hear all the I told you so's I would get from everyone I knew if she did cheat. One afternoon he called to say that Lori and Jeff were in Jeff's father's office kissing. The kiss was out of line. I talked to her about it that evening. She denied it at first, but finally admitted that she and Roger had played around and kissed a little, but nothing serious. Is something serious going to happen? I asked. Of course not, she replied. I made it unequivocally clear that I would not tolerate any more playing and kissing and that adultery would certainly lead to divorce. We can get divorced as quickly as we got married, and I won't delay divorce if you ever sleep with anyone else. Although I never told her how I knew about her and Roger, Jeff was fired the next day. It wasn't hard to guess. Lori and I never discussed his firing, but I commented on how stupid it was to fire someone with a disability. I also mentioned that Jeff and I were going to file a complaint against Justin with the ADA organization. No one ever thought Jeff was disabled, just slow, and the mention of filing a complaint was just my excuse. He and I never discussed any of this. The next day, Jeff was rehired at one of the other two dealerships owned by Martin Justin, Jr., but the employees where he had originally worked protested so much that he was returned to his original position. It was an interesting exercise in human relations. Virtually all the employees at the dealership stood up for Jeff. Since our conversation and my statement that divorce can be obtained quickly, Lori and I have had several discussions about how married people should behave. The first and most important of these behaviors is to never allow yourself to get into a situation that would not be spouse-approved. For example, while dining alone with a member of the opposite sex who is not a family member may be perfectly innocent, his or her appearance can cause rumors to spread, especially in a small town. Once rumors begin to spread, they can no longer be controlled, and a good reputation can quickly be ruined. After that conversation, we did some thinking and decided to take a vacation and try to recapture some of the magic, some of the fever that was mentioned in the song at our reception. We planned the trip, got some time off, packed our bags, and hit the road. It took us two full days to get on the road. The first few hours of the trip were pleasant enough, but then... We hadn't been on the road four hours when her phone rang. She looked at it, but didn't answer it. She did, however, turn the ringer off. Less than an hour later, she got another call. She held the phone in her hand and it vibrated. Feeling the vibration, she jumped up nervously. She looked, but did not answer, and after a few minutes asked if we could stop to go to the bathroom. We pulled into a large truck stop. I pulled up to the pump and she jumped out and went inside. I usually don't like thoughtless drivers who fill up the tank and then leave the car parked at the pump while they themselves go to the store or use the service. This usually means that other drivers have to wait for them to fill up. Things go much smoother if you park your car after refueling and then go inside, but heck, those are just my complaints. I was the most careless person that time. When she hurried inside, I followed her. She never looked back, and as soon as she was out the door, she was on the phone. I told you I'd call you when I had a chance. There was a pause. Damn it, Roger, I'm serious. I'll call you when I get back. Another pause. Roger, don't. She looked at her phone, then looked around. I hid under a long shelf of snacks and waited a few seconds before looking up to see if she was there. She was standing with her back to me when I heard her words. You son of a bitch. Don't ever hang up on me again. Apparently, the son of a bitch did hang up, because she looked at her obviously dead phone again. That time, she didn't look around. She just tried to call him, but he didn't answer. She was looking at her phone when I walked over and stood in front of her. Is everything okay? I asked. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. She looked at me. I have to go to the bathroom, she said, hurrying away. I went back to the car and filled up the tank. She came out with a soda. I looked at her. That's okay. I'll get mine, I said, stepping inside. She stared at me, as if she didn't realize that it would have been nice to at least ask if I wanted anything from the store. As I was leaving the soda store, I looked over. 
she was on the phone again. She ended the conversation just as I opened the door to get in the car. I didn't say anything, started the car and drove off. That night we spent in a motel. Pizza was delivered to our room and we went to bed before 10. We spent most of the next day driving, hardly speaking at all. We checked into the hotel, had dinner in the dining room and went to bed. I was still awake, staring into the darkness, when I saw her phone buzz after 11. No noise, just the light. She jumped up and ran to the bathroom with it. I slowly got up and stood behind the closed bathroom door, trying to hear, but I couldn't. Please don't, were the only two words I understood. The conversation went on for a few minutes while I stood there trying to make out what she was saying, but I couldn't. I was still standing there when she opened the door. She screamed! I had scared the hell out of her. What? What are you doing there? She asked when she realized who it was. I was just wondering what you were doing in there. I pointed to the bathroom. Nothing. Just went to the bathroom. You needed a phone for that? Yeah. I used the light so I didn't hurt anything getting here. She tried to step around me. You forgot to flush. Oh. Yes. She came back and blushed. Who were you talking to? What? Who were you talking to? No one. Why? I knew she was lying and she knew I knew. I'm going to bed. In the morning, tell me who you talked to and what you talked about, or we're going home. We went on this trip to try to figure things out, but it takes both of us. Secrets don't bode well if that's our plan. I went to bed where I finally fell asleep just before dawn. She was sitting on the couch in the room when I woke up about an hour after I'd fallen asleep. I pulled myself up, put a couple pillows under me, and looked at her. She looked back at me. That was Roger. What was that about? He wants me to sleep with him. I thought for a moment before answering. Again? I asked. She hesitated before nodding. It was a shot in the dark on my part. I had no reason to believe they had actually slept together. Honestly, I was dumbfounded by her admission. How many times have you slept with him so far? Two. Why? I'm not sure. The first was curiosity, I think. And the other one? He said if I didn't, he'd tell you. And he's threatening again. Yes. I knew what my reaction would be. I had never let her know that cheating was okay. More than that, I had explicitly told her what would happen if she did and expected no less from her if I cheated. You know it will end our marriage, don't you? Tears appeared in her eyes and she nodded again. I got up and went to the bathroom. No matter what is going on around you, when you feel the urge to pee, you pee. After rinsing off the water and washing my hands, I brushed my teeth, washed my face, put the toothbrush and toothpaste back in the shaving kit, and opened the door. I'm on my way home. You can come with me or wait for him to pick you up. It only took a few minutes to pack up and leave the room. I checked us out. We got in the car and began the long drive, with stops only for gas, restroom, and fast food mentioned earlier. The trip should have given her a chance to apologize, beg for forgiveness, or plead for a second chance. But she did none of those things. What's more, we didn't speak the entire time. When we stopped, she bought her own food and I bought mine. If she needed to stop to use the restroom, she never once mentioned it. When we stopped, she was always the first one back in the car. At home, my first day of work was over. The house had been cleared of everything that belonged to Lori, and I hadn't eaten anything good in days. We had never used the only meal delivery service in town, but I figured now was a good time to start. I went to their website, opened an account, and ordered the food. Forty minutes later, the delivery service rang my doorbell. I picked up my food, tipped the driver in addition to what I had added to the total when I ordered the food, and looked forward to enjoying it with a glass, or two, or six, of wine. I put the food on the tray by the TV and sat down to eat. From my chair I could see both the TV and the street through the window. There was a car parked outside with someone sitting behind the wheel. While I was eating, my attention shifted from the TV to the car where the driver was sitting. I was halfway through my meal and the driver still hadn't moved. I took a sip of wine and walked outside. The driver saw me and rolled down his window. It was my food delivery driver and she was in tears. Are you okay? I asked. No. 
My car won't start and I can't call anyone for help. I hadn't paid attention to her or her car when she first arrived because my mind was on other things. Everyone I know is tied up or unresponsive and my brother won't be able to get here for another hour. Another thing I didn't notice was the baby in the back seat. She was sitting with a book on her lap and looked like she wanted to cry too. Do you want me to look at her? Oh God, please do it. She opened her door and slipped inside. I got behind the wheel and turned the key. Click, 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 then nothing. I did it again. No click this time. Just nothing. I'm not a mechanic, but I think I know when the battery is low. I brought my car and tried to start it, but to no avail. Suddenly it was beyond my strength. Look, why don't you two go inside? I'll have my cousin come in and take a look at it. They reluctantly followed me in. Make yourselves comfortable while I call for him. Jeff was there in 15 minutes and her car was ready in 30. She thanked me, talked to Jeff, gave him a hug and left. The next two days at work sucked. I hadn't told anyone about Lori and my boss was on my ass like white on rice and I was tired of it. My personal life was in the toilet and he expected to get a silk purse from a sow's ear on a marginally profitable project. I decided it was time for a meeting with him. I'm tired of being pestered by you. The project was a failure from the start, and I told you it was a failure. I hate ultimatums, but you either stay out of my ass and let me see what I can make of it, or give it to someone else, or just kiss my ass and I'll walk out of here. Take your pick. I'm going home. Call me when you decide. I was sure he'd let me cool off for a couple days and then call me back into work. Besides, I needed to find a lawyer and start divorce proceedings. In the evening, I called Jeff to see if he wanted a drink, although drinking with him involves wine or beer for me and almost beer for him. I can't. I have a date. He dated when we were both in high school, and when I was in college, he would often call me and tell me about his rare dates, asking for my advice. If he was lucky, I never heard about it, but he was the kind of guy who wouldn't brag about it even to me. Besides being a bit slow, he was also terribly shy, and strangers made him very nervous. Well, good for you. Who's the lucky girl? Jenny. Jenny who? Feeding girl. What kind of food? The one outside your house with the broken car. Are you serious? Yes. Well, Mr. Smooth Talker, how did it happen? When I was fixing her car, I told her that if she needed any more help, have her call me. So she did. And you helped her again. He giggled like a child. Yeah. So where are you taking her? Nowhere. There's no room? No. I'm going to her house. She's making dinner for me. I laughed, happy for him but I couldn't resist the opportunity to tease him. You know she's a vegetarian, don't you? What's that? This is someone who eats only plants. No meat. No eggs. No dairy products. Jeff was a real meat and potatoes kind of guy. There are a couple restaurants that advertise that if you eat a huge steak, which is more like a roast with salad, vegetables, and dessert, it's free. One of them is located not far from us. Jeff did just that. He was sick for two days, but he did it. No meat? Not even a hamburger? What am I going to eat? Well, there'll be a lot of lettuce. Maybe some beans. And if we're lucky, some quinoa. Queen who? Not the queen. Quinoa. It's a seed that is used to make many vegetarian dishes. Years ago in the Lake Titicaca area of South America, it was fed to animals before people started eating it. What? I'm not hungry anymore. I laughed into the tube. I'm kidding, Jeff. I have no idea what she's eating, but whatever it is, I'm sure it'll be delicious. Go have fun. I decided to call the food delivery service again so I could eat dinner on my own. The next day, I was doing chores around the house. Lori was gone, and I still had over a year left on my lease, so I figured I'd make it as comfortable as I could. I also figured my boss would call, apologize, and ask me to come back to work. By mid-afternoon, he still hadn't called, but his wife did. Tim, I'm tired of hearing your father complain about you messing things up. You have a degree. Why don't you go work for someone else if you two can't find common ground? I'm thinking about it, Mom, but you know I'll have to move somewhere else. 
That's the only thing wrong with it. Why can't you just do what he wants? Because he's doing things the old way. We need to modernize. Did you explain it to him? Over and over, but he's too stubborn to listen. Well, I don't want you to move, so talk to him again. Okay. I promise. He'll come to his senses and call me tomorrow, I'm sure. I'm looking right at him. Just come back to work tomorrow. He nods his head that it's okay. Now, why don't you and Lori come over for dinner tomorrow? I'd love to, Mom, but she won't be there. Why not? I had been putting off telling her, but I decided it was time. I started telling her, and she started telling her father until he told her to put her on speakerphone. When I was done, he picked up the phone. Here's what we're going to do. I'm firing you so you don't have a job. When it goes to court, you'll have no income and you won't have to pay her alimony. You'll get your job after the divorce. I told you she was worthless and she proved it. You'll be better off without her, my mom added. Thank you both, but I'll take care of it. I'll see you at the office, Dad. Mom, I'll see you tomorrow at dinner. All the next day, I tried to explain why and how I thought the changes would help the company, but my dad was more interested in hearing about Lori and telling me, I told you so. After work, we had dinner with my mom, and I had to retell the story about Lori and listen to him say, I told you so, while my mom added her own. When I got home, Lori was standing on the porch. It was the first time I'd seen her since our disrupted trip. I could see her in the light of the porch light. I pulled into the garage and from there I went into the house. As I went to the switch by the front door, turned off the porch light, and then went to take a shower, the doorbell rang. When I was done, she was gone. Finding a lawyer was easy. Finding one who wanted to have anything to do with a divorce in which Roger Justin was directly or indirectly involved was a little more difficult, but I found one. Of course I'll take the case. His old man sold me the biggest lemon I ever ate, and he never made up for it. And so it began. Paperwork. Meetings. Meetings with Lori and her lawyer. In all that time, I never once spoke to her directly, and other than a visit to the house the night I ignored her, she showed no interest in talking, and I didn't want to talk at all. She was cheating, so as far as I was concerned, conversation was futile. According to Jeff, Lori moved to one of the other dealerships, and Roger began to rarely show up there. There was talk that Roger had left her and gone to someone more deserving. Meanwhile, Jeff and Jenny got along great, and Jenny's daughter thought he was wonderful. He divided his free time between her house and mine and was happier than I had ever seen him. The more he talked about his relationship with Jenny, the more I realized that the only personal relationship I'd had in the past few weeks was with my hand. I walked home from work, occasionally stopping by the lawyer's office, the grocery store, or my parents' house. Dad got his dose of I told you so and even made a couple of attempts to understand my ideas for improving the company. My mom kept finding me girls and I refused to meet them. Our town is relatively small and I didn't even realize there were as many single and eligible girls as she was finding. I think she's casting call, handsome, educated, 28-year-old man in the process of divorce, looking for the right girl. Must be honest, loyal, and trustworthy. Looks are secondary to personality for her. Must love music, theater, good wines, and good food. I stopped returning her calls after the fifth date she set me up and told my dad that the first time he mentioned setting me up, I moved to Houston. I finally talked to Lori the day our divorce was final. The judge banged the gavel announcing the end of the marriage, and I walked over to her. Was it worth it? I turned and walked away before she could answer. Jeff used to tidy my car but stopped because he was too busy cleaning Jenny's car, so one Saturday I was washing it. He pulled into the driveway with Jenny and her daughter Sophie. Sophie was about seven or eight years old. They were going to the mall and asked if I wanted to go with them. I dipped the sponge into the bucket of water, wiped my hands and said, let's go. When I'm so bored, I go to the mall to walk around so there's something to do. I've reached the bottom of the barrel, but that's exactly what I did. We were there for about an hour and I was starting to regret my decision to come when we passed an ice cream stand and Sophie asked if she could have some. Not now, honey, Jenny said. It's too close to dinner. Well, the hell with it, I said. Come on, Soph, I want to do it too. She grabbed my hand and ran. I'll see you later, I shouted over my shoulder. 
We licked ice cream cones and walked holding hands. We have to hold hands, Sophie said. My mom told me that she doesn't want to get lost when we walk with a lot of people, so I have to hold her hand. I don't want you to get lost, so I have to hold your hand too. That's a good idea. We had been walking for a few minutes now, and when she wasn't licking her ice cream cone, she was chatting. Suddenly, I felt myself being thrown to the ground, and I passed out, hitting my head on the floor. When I came to, I was handcuffed, surrounded by police officers and an angry mob. I looked at Sophie. She was crying and was being held in my arms by a woman. What the hell? Just shut up, Slytherin. We'll get to you in a minute. It's okay, Sophie, I heard the woman say. He can't hurt you now. He didn't hurt me. He bought me ice cream. I know, baby. Bad men do that sometimes. He's not a bad man, Aunt Louise. Where's my mommy? I called her. She's on her way. Is Tim hurt? Who's Tim? Him, she said, pointing at me. Every time I tried to speak, the policeman ordered me to shut up. Do you know him? Yes. He's Jeff's cousin. We're here to do some shopping. My goodness, Aunt Louise said, then turned to one of the policemen. I think I've made a mistake. Jesus, lady, don't tell me that. He looked at the crowd. We better get him out of here before this crowd rips him to shreds. He grabbed my hand. Let's go. Some of the crowd followed us into the security office. I heard words like castrate the bastard and let us take him away. I was getting scared, and every time I started to say something, one police officer or another would tell me to shut up, that I would have a chance to talk later. They took me into a room, searched me, emptied my pockets, and still handcuffed me. Finally, two policemen came in, uncuffed me, gave me back my wallet, watched and other things, and started apologizing. Jenny and Jeff came in as well. Oh my God, Tim, I'm so sorry, Jenny said. My sister saw you with Sophie, didn't know who you were, and thought you were kidnapping her. I rubbed my wrists. I had seen people in handcuffs on TV who rubbed their wrists when they were taken off. I didn't understand why before, but now I did. The damn things hurt. I was pissed off, shocked, still a little scared and nervous. Jeff kept asking if I was okay, Jenny kept apologizing, and Sophie was clinging to Jenny as hard as she could. I looked at one of the officers. Can I go now? Yes, sir, but before you leave, we'd like you to sign a release form. You just put me on the ground, knocked me out, handcuffed me, and called me names. I'm not signing any release form until I talk to my lawyer. I walked out of the room into a larger space. One of the mall security officers was standing at the door. Is this the way out? Yes, sir, but I wouldn't go there if I were you. Why not? Because there are people who think you're a child molester and are waiting for you. Jesus Christ. Can this day get any worse? Can't you tell them the truth? We tried. We'll escort you out the back door, Mr. Jeffries, said the police sergeant. He or someone else had obviously looked in my wallet and knew my name. Take him to my car, Jeff said. The sergeant looked at me. Why don't you let us drive you home? We'll use my car. It's unmarked. Let's go. It wasn't that I was angry or upset with Jeff, Jenny, or even Aunt Louise. I just wanted to get out of there and decided that the quickest and safest way was a police escort. We were already at the back door when Aunt Louise stopped me. I'm so sorry. I saw you with Sophie and thought you were kidnapping her. I took a deep breath. I understand, but I've been attacked, knocked out, and a bunch of people out there, I pointed to the main office door, want to cut my balls off. I don't think you should be talking to me right now. Then turned to the sergeant. Take me home. After I gave him my address, we didn't talk about anything until we pulled into my driveway. My phone rang at least six times, but I paid no attention to it. I didn't want to talk to anyone. At home, I started to get out of his car and he stopped me. Mr. Jeffries, I'm sorry you're in this situation, but from my point of view, I'd rather it happen this way than have a young girl kidnapped because someone saw something but didn't say anything. I'll take good Samaritans like Louise Garner any day. 
I understand and agree with you on your position, but tonight on the news, my name and picture will likely be broadcast all over the county. Since it was a mistake, it shouldn't have been reported at all, but it's sensationalized, so it will be. The news people can't help themselves. Then the news will say it was a mistake and it's okay, but half the people who see it won't believe that part of the story and I'll be stigmatized for life. Thanks for the ride home. Maybe it's not so bad. I'll see what I can do. Yes, and pigs can fly, I thought to myself. I got in the car and drove straight to my parents' house. In the evening, we watched the local news, and sure enough, there they were. They were already going on when we turned on the TV and found the right channel. We missed the first part of the story, but what we heard said something about, when you see something, say something, even if it turns out to be a mistake. By not saying something, you could condemn an innocent child to an unbelievable fate. The positive thing for me was that they didn't say my name or show my picture. The commentator even ended the report by saying, We chose not to name the gentleman for fear that his life would be turned even more upside down than it was this afternoon. On a personal note, I offer him my sincerest apologies. This is Louise Garner. Good night. Well, you dodged a bullet, my father said. It wasn't as bad as you thought. No, you didn't. What are you going to do now? asked Mom. Let it go as it goes, I guess. If I tried to sue for false arrest, it would be publicized, and my name and picture would probably be on the rumor mill. I don't want that to happen, and the police did what they thought was right at the time. On the way home, I remembered my phone. By then, there were eight messages. Three were from Jeff, apologizing for what had happened and telling me how bad Jenny was feeling. Judging by the caller ID, the others were from the city police and the local TV station. I didn't listen to any of them. Later, I remembered the woman in the TV news department finishing the program. This is Louise Garner. Good night. Oh, shit. What did the police sergeant say to me? I'll take good Samaritans like Louise Garner any day. Well, kiss my ass. I didn't get a good look at her at the mall, so I didn't recognize her on TV. The makeup must have made her look different. I called Jeff because I knew he would be worried about me. Are you okay? He asked. I'm fine. But still a little shaken up. How's Sophie? She's a good one. She got scared when the police jumped on you and dropped the ice cream. She got better when we got her some more and she realized you were okay. I'm glad she's okay. Have you seen the news? Most of it. The first part we missed. Damn, that was the best part. Why? Louise started talking about what had happened and how she was the one who had initiated the whole thing. She said she saw her niece walking with a strange man and basically panicked. She followed you while she was on the phone with the police. She didn't trust mall security, so she stayed behind you and kept the police informed of where you were until they arrived. She took full responsibility for what happened and said she would probably do it again under the same circumstances. I think I understand that. She was afraid you would be able to escape with Sophie before the police arrived, so as she followed you, she was looking for objects to hit you with. She really feels bad. Why didn't you tell me earlier that Jenny's sister was on TV? I didn't think it mattered. No, I guess not. I got the impression that the other night when Jenny was bringing food to my house that she, well, that she needed the money. But if her sister's a TV presenter, she can't be too bad. It's a local product, so Louise doesn't make a lot of money. I don't know how much, but I know it's not very much. And Jenny's like most of us, I think. She's doing well, but she doesn't have anything extra. If she wants something extra, she has to find the money. She's saving up for a vacation, so she has a second job delivering food. Good for her. Yes, he paused. I like her, Tim, and she likes me. She doesn't care that I'm slow. I smiled. No one cares that you're slow, Jeff. It doesn't matter to your friends, and we don't care what anyone else thinks. Over the next few days, things went back to normal, and nothing was said about the incident at the mall. I didn't see Jenny or Sophie, but Jeff and I talked every couple of days as usual. It was another Saturday mid-morning. I was eating a late breakfast of biscuits and gravy when the doorbell rang. I opened the door, and there stood Louise Garner. Good morning. Are you busy? She asked. Not really. I just put some ointment on my wrists to ease the pain of the handcuffs. 
Tim, if I may call you that, I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. Now that I've been in handcuffs, all my buddies in the hood treat me with more respect. Maybe I'd better go. No, no. Come on in. I just got off the phone with the parole officer. She only looked at me sadly. I can only apologize so many times. I'm sorry for bothering you. She turned to leave. Wait a minute, I said. I had no reason to act like a jerk. She paused. I'm still coming around a little. I'll get over it. Well, when you do, give me a call, she handed me a business card. I owe you at least lunch. I don't know about lunch, but have you had breakfast? Actually, no. Do you like cookies and gravy? Sausage and gravy? Yes. One of my favorites, she said, smiling. I opened the door wide and she came in. In the kitchen, I gave her a plate and pointed to the stove where there were biscuits and gravy. Do you want me to heat up the gravy? I asked. I can do that if you don't mind, she said. Help yourself. Coffee? Yes, please. Would you like anything in it? This may sound strange, but do you have any chocolate milk? Instead of coffee? Uh, no, in it. In it? Yes, she answered timidly. I know it sounds weird, but... She was only the second person in my life to add chocolate milk to coffee. The other was me. Only in the last few years had I been substituting it with Bailey's. Did Jeff put you up to this? What? Chocolate milk in your coffee? No. Why? I'm the only person I know who does this, or rather has done this, only now it's you too. Are you sure Jeff didn't put you up to this? I've been drinking chocolate milk in my coffee since I started drinking it. My whole family does too, even Sophie when Jenny lets her. I don't have chocolate milk, but I do have Bailey's. The rest of the morning passed quickly and pleasantly, and Louise began to turn the coffee into Bailey's. It was the first breakfast she and I shared, but far from the last. We started dating, and I became her biggest fan on television. Our first kiss happened on our third date. Our first sex happened three weeks after that, and it was my first sex since Lori and my aborted quest for new knowledge, where the only thing I discovered was that she cheated on me. Shortly after Jeff and Jenny became a couple, he decided he wanted more out of life and started working on cars full-time. Within six months, he had his own garage and more business than he could handle. Jenny and Sophie were clearly to his liking. I'm sure there's a scientific or psychological explanation for this, but it seemed to me that Jeff got... What? Smarter? Faster? More alert? I can't say exactly what, but he became different and much more confident. Louise and I helped him when he moved in with Jenny. Sophie shadowed him and walked everywhere he went. I saw them holding hands and told her she wasn't letting him get lost. No, we don't let each other get lost. I couldn't think of anything nicer she could say about him. A year after the divorce, I learned that Lori was getting married again, but not to Roger Justin. She was marrying some poor guy who worked for the city sanitation department. They'd known each other five months. I mentally wished him luck. I figured he'd need it. I realized long ago that I had no hatred or even dislike for her. It was both our fault for getting married so early. Of course, the affair was entirely her fault. Life was good for almost two years. Jeff and Jenny were planning their wedding, Louise was the maid of honor, and I was the best man. Their parents divorced when Louise, the youngest of the siblings, was four years old. Their brother was to walk Jenny down the aisle. The lease on my house expired, and I moved in with Louise. Marriage was never discussed and we were both perfectly happy that even in the midst of Jeff and Jenny's wedding plans, there was no talk of our wedding. There is a publication that lists job openings at radio and TV stations across the country. Unbeknownst to Louise, the guy who was preparing her news program had collected some of her old videos and sent them out to much larger markets than our little neighborhood. He liked her work and wanted to help her promote herself. One day, she got a call from a TV station in Houston. The news director watched some videos and asked for more. Eventually, he asked her to come to Houston for a conversation. She was thrilled, and we talked about it. It was a dream come true for her, and we decided she should go. After the interview, 
she told me that one of the videos he saw that made him want her was the one where she thought I was kidnapping Sophie. The conversation went well. They gave her an audition on camera and said they would call her. They came. Two weeks later, they offered her a job. The hiring decision was a foregone conclusion as far as I was concerned. It was a huge step towards a possible national gig, which is of course what every broadcaster aspires to. My hard-headed father was finally persuaded to do a couple things my way, and the change worked. Our business grew slowly but surely, and I was happy to help him. He was happy, I was happy, our employees were more than happy and profits were very high. Moving to Houston was not a viable option for me. Houston was four hours away, but Louise and I had come to the conclusion that we could endure the distance and keep our relationship alive. And we did. For six months. Then the trips to each other's houses and phone calls became less and less frequent. We couldn't watch it on TV because our cable provider didn't provide that option. I could watch it online and often did. She worked there for only three months and was moved from the newsroom to a daily talk show where she and her co-host talked to guests and the studio audience about everything. They also attended almost every charity event in the broadcast area. Their pictures appeared periodically in the newspaper and on the website, and she seemed to be having the time of her life. Oddly enough, so did I. The challenge of a growing business suited me perfectly, and I was spending less and less time doing what Louise was doing. Of course, the downside was that she had to sleep alone, at least for me. I didn't realize she was sleeping with her handsome roommate or anyone else. But since Lori was my only reference point, the thought never left my mind. One Wednesday morning, I drove to Houston to surprise her. I told my dad I was taking the rest of the week off and going to see her. Does it have to be this week? He asked. It's been quite a while, and I think she and I need to talk. I'd prefer you wait. I can't. Right after we talked, Jeff called and said he needed help in the afternoon and asked when I could come over. I'm going to Houston. I'll be back on Sunday. It'll be too late. What's so important that it can't wait? I asked. It's something for Jenny. Jeff, I'm sorry, but I can't. I'm leaving for Houston. Their show aired live every morning. After lunch, they would research their guests and develop a plan for the next day's show. They didn't just come in, do an hour-long show and go home. They spent all day researching and developing the program. I got to her apartment just after noon. I decided to wait for her there but found that my key no longer worked. I rang the bell but there was no answer. I went to the manager's office and asked for a new key. She recognized me and greeted me warmly, but when I told her what I wanted, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. Why not? We have a new policy that only the tenant can authorize the issuance of keys or admission to the premises, and they must physically sign for the keys. But you know me. Yes, sir, I want to, but rules are rules. Let me ask you a question. Good. And if I were her husband, would it matter? It depends on who signed the lease. Only the tenant can authorize it. Period. I immediately realized there was a brick wall in front of us, so I walked out of her office and headed to my car through the parking garage. Her reserved spot was empty. I called her from the car. Without answering, I left a message for her to call me. It is. Just a few minutes later. Hi, honey, she said when I answered. Hey. How are you? Same old, same old. How's it going? I was thinking of coming this weekend. That would be great. I have to finish the project we're working on by Friday. Okay. What project? This is one of the charitable organizations our boss is involved in. We're developing a contest with lots of prizes for the biggest donors. It's fun, but a lot of work. Are you working on him today? No. I needed some rest, so I took the day off. And what are you doing? Just relaxing. Good for you. Get some rest and I'll see you Friday. Okay, sweetheart. Take care of yourself. Love you. Bye. I tried to say I love you, but I failed. I walked back through the garage, past her still empty parking space to the elevator, got off at her floor, rang the bell several times and waited each time before giving up and leaving.
For a very brief moment, I was torn between leaving and continuing to watch and wait for her. I even thought about calling her again and telling her where I was, but decided against it. She had made her bed and was probably already lying in it. The problem was that it wasn't her bed if that's what she was doing. I left. I was in no hurry to go home. There were two cars on one side of the driveway and two parked on the street on the other. One was my parents' car and the other was Jeff's. I wasn't in the mood for company, and since they thought I'd be gone for the rest of the week, I wondered why they were even here. I pulled up to the house and used the remote to open the garage door. Louise's car was parked in the garage. I got out of the car and the door to the kitchen was opened by Jeff. Bowing at the waist, he invited me in and then led me into the living room, where my parents, Jenny, Sophie, Jenny, and Louise's mother and brother and Louise were standing. Louise stood in front of the fireplace surrounded by the others. Jeff nudged me toward her. Everyone was smiling except Louise. She just looked nervous. I walked over to her and she dropped to one knee, swearing to God. Tim, I love you. If you're going to kidnap someone, I want it to be me so we can live happily ever after. Will you marry me? She asked, holding out a small box to me. The events of the day faded away as I opened the box and found a gold ring with a diamond in the setting, staring back at me. She was still on one knee when I pulled the ring out of the box and took a closer look at it. I started to put it on her finger, but she stopped me. No, silly. That's a wedding ring. You can't wear it until the wedding. That is, if there's a wedding because you never answered me. I looked around at the faces in the room, then looked at her. Sure. Why not? Everyone nodded approvingly. Romantic? Not at all, but I said it with a wide smile, hugging her. You're such a jerk, she said after we kissed. Choosing today in particular to come visit me. You almost ruined the whole thing. Dad patted me on the back. We didn't know what to do. You insisted on going to Houston, and Louise was on her way here. Even Jeff tried to stop you. We talked to her, and she told us you'd probably be back tonight, so we went on. What was so important that you insisted on traveling today specifically? I looked at the people around me. Honestly? Yes, everyone but Sophie and Louise said in one voice. Louise spoke up. Let me try to explain this. She took a deep breath and took both of my hands in hers. For the past couple months, we've both felt like we were getting further and further apart. Two separate lives and living a few hours away from each other. We were both happy in our jobs and lives, but felt like something was missing. I looked back on my time in Houston and remembered the parties, the fun, the people, everything I wanted out of life. My job is perfect, but my life is incomplete. It's incomplete because I can't share these beautiful moments with you. There were tears in her eyes as she continued. I knew that if I have these feelings, you will have them too if you love me. I wanted to share every aspect of your life with me. About what's good about your business and how happy you are when things are going well. She paused. Am I right? All I could do was nod my head up and down. I love you, Tim, with every fiber of my being. And I love you, I told her, and I meant it. At that moment, the party started. Sophie, Jeff, and Jenny were the last to leave. Sophie wanted to hug me, so I took her in my arms. Does this mean you're my uncle now? She asked in a whisper. Yes, I whispered back. Good. When they left, Louise and I sat down on the couch, each with our own glass of wine, relaxed back, content in each other's company. Do you know another reason I went to Houston today? I asked her. I think so. Why? You were worried that I would live there alone and possibly start a relationship with another man. What about you? What? Get involved with another man? Yes. No. The only men I've had a real connection with are my producer, the studio crew, and Thomas. Thomas was her co-host. The thing I was most worried about was Thomas. All those events you went to and your pictures in the papers. I was worried and jealous. She leaned over and kissed me. Silly girl. I could tell you that Thomas is gay and you have nothing to worry about, but that would be a lie. The truth is, he's the most narcissistic bastard I've ever seen. He expects people, especially women, to bow down to him. We worked well together, but I personally don't care about him, and he doesn't care about me. She sipped her wine. 
I wouldn't lie about him being gay, but I lied to you. I chuckled. Yes, it is. My property manager helped. I was just on my way here when your father called and said you were on your way. I called the manager and told her what was going on. She said she would take care of it. She called me a few minutes later and told me that the repairmen were on their way to change the lock on my door. She decided that if you could get into the apartment, you would stay and wait for me, no matter how long it took, which neither of us wanted to do. I felt like I knew you well enough to know how you would react if you thought I was doing something wrong, so I chose that direction. I knew that if I gave you a reason, you wouldn't bother to ask for details. Your experience with Lori would make you think the worst and act accordingly. I'm sorry I misled you, but I knew it would lead you back here, to where I wanted to propose to you in front of your family. Do you forgive me? It was unmistakable. Of course I do, and I'm sorry for my lame agreement. I was in shock. She laughed. We all wanted you to be shocked. Well, it was. I leaned over and kissed her. I loved this woman, and then I took another sip of wine. What time are you leaving back to Houston? It was a four-hour drive and she had a show, so she usually left in the middle of the night. I'd forgotten about her show that day. Or are you driving back tonight? I asked. I didn't want to waste any more time. I wanted to get her into bed. Soon. Well, she hesitated. Let's talk about it. Today's show was taped on Monday. The shows for tomorrow and Friday were taped yesterday. Friday's show will announce that it will be my last show because I want to go home to be with my future husband. I sat back and looked at her. That's normal, right? Of course it's good. It's better than just okay. It's great, but won't you miss it? Yeah, but I miss you more. And I was hoping to convince my old station to let me develop a show featuring local heroes, talent, events, and people. That should be enough to... To what? Until the baby comes. And then we'll see. I took a sip of wine. She sat back and looked at me. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. I just didn't realize Jenny was pregnant. She shook her head. She isn't, Goose. I am. Oh. I managed not to drop my glass as I set it on the table and grabbed her. Our life is beautiful. Louise is back at her old radio station and has the same program she had in Houston, just without a co-host. Our daughter Danielle is great. My dad's business and my business are doing well. And Sophie can't wait to be able to walk Danielle and hold her hand so she doesn't get lost. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.